in this short video, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk to you about the collision between the Federal Bankruptcy Code and Article 9 of the UCC. For example, there are often situations where a debtor enters into bankruptcy. When this happens, when the debtor becomes insolvent and formally files a petition for bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trustee assumes awesome powers that has a monumental impact on secured and unsecured creditors, creditors who are perfected and creditors who are unperfected in either case. So there are a couple different uh, sections of the Federal Bankruptcy Code that can absolutely knock out the rights and the interests of creditors who might have had particular interests or rights that were given to them under state law under Article 9 of the UCC. So let's just go through some of these key provisions of the Bankruptcy Code that impacts Article 9 creditors under Article 9 of the UCC. For example, there's one important consideration from the date and the moment in time that the bankruptcy petition is filed, Section 362 of the Federal Bankruptcy Code implements an automatic stay of creditor activity for 120 days. So on the 120 days immediately following the filing of a bankruptcy petition, creditors, whether they be secured or unsecured, perfected or unperfected, cannot take any collection activity against a bankrupt estate or the debtor in any form under this provision. So this is really important. Another section of the Federal Bankruptcy Code that has a, a major impact on the activities of creditors is the strong arm clause of Section 544. Under the strong arm clause, the bankruptcy trustee is treated like a judicial creditor, and they're given the rights that a judicial creditor or lien holder would have over all property at the time of filing that's included in the bankrupt estate. So this provision, the strong arm clause, puts the bankruptcy trustee in the shoes of the, of the bankrupt. So anything that they could do with their own property under the strong arm clause, now the bankruptcy trustee has those same powers and those same rights over property that makes up the bankrupt estate. Also, in addition to the strong arm clause, you have to keep in mind uh, Bankruptcy Code Section 558. Any defenses that a debtor would have had to creditor claims, those same defenses inure to the benefit of the bankruptcy trustee. So if I wanted to defend a creditor claim and say that it was unperfected, or that it was unsecured, if I had that power to make those arguments on my own behalf under Section 558, the bankruptcy trustee gets those same powers to defend claims that I would have. So this is really important. This is an important section. There are finally two additional sections when we talk about the impact or the collision between the Federal Bankruptcy Code and Article 9 that are really monumental and have great impact on creditors. For example, we look at any activity that improves the status or the standing of any given creditor or creditors in the lead up to the bankruptcy uh, petition, to the filing of the bankruptcy petition. If, for example, I had a debt uh, to a particular creditor, and I decided that I like that creditor better than my other creditors, and I knew that I was insolvent and heading towards bankruptcy, and I decide that I want to make sure that the creditor or the creditors that I like get paid first. If I make preferential payments to creditors to improve their standing or better their position, those payments can be attacked by the bankruptcy trustee. So presumptively, if a payment is made in the 90 days preceding the filing of the bankruptcy proceed, one that benefits one creditor or several creditors to the detriment 
of other creditors, the bankruptcy trustee can attack those payments as preferential payments uh, to a given creditor. So this is important. This is the preference language found in Section 547 of the Bankruptcy Code. Also keep in mind, the bankruptcy trustee can look back further and claw back other transactions if the payment on behalf of the debtor or the bankrupt is to an insider. And insiders is a broadly defined term. That could be an officer, a director, a spouse or a family member or someone who cohabitates with the bankrupt or the debtor uh, that gets a preferential treatment, uh, treatment or payment that doesn't uh, better the position of other creditors, that betters their position, in fact. In this rare situation, or in these, I shouldn't say rare, but in these situations where there are preferential treatments to insiders, the bankruptcy trustee can look back a further period of time. They can go back up to one year and claw back preferential treatment and payments uh, to insiders. And finally, the other important section to remember in the bankruptcy code is section 548 and 544B. Any fraudulent transactions that are made to defraud creditors or evade the process of marshalling all the assets of the bankrupt estate, those can be attacked as fraudulent transfers uh, by the bankruptcy trustee. Oftentimes we look to state law to define what is a fraudulent transfer or conveyance. If a matter or if a transfer is a fraudulent conveyance or transfer under state law, if it's actionable or it can be attacked uh, under state law, the bankruptcy trustee can also reach into that very same state law and use it as a basis to attack any fraudulent transfers that might take place. So this is just in a nutshell, some of the meaningful impact that shows you that oftentimes the Federal Bankruptcy Code and Article 9 of the, of the UCC collide. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that it was helpful. Have a great day.